How many know it's a good day to have a good day? It's a great day to have a great day. Well, if you're a first-time guest, we're glad that you're here. If you're a second, a third, or however long, we're glad that you're here. We're starting a new series today. And this series, we say things like, this will change your life. And sometimes when we say things like that, it loses the weight of it. But I truly believe this series will change your life. Because it's going to change your direction. It's going to change your direction. If you want to change your life, you got to change your direction. And that's what the series is going to do. And I'm so excited. How many like to fish? Any, any anglers here, you like to fish? Man, come on. All right, okay. Now there's, there's, okay, awesome. How many are like me? You like to fish. Like, I love to go deep sea fishing. Because, you know, you show up. They got it all ready to go. And they're like, man, here you go. And I'm not, oh, man, I put the bait on and take the fish off. But there's a whole lot about fishing I don't know. Anybody like that? And so, man, to get on a boat, it's chartered. They know. They got the whole thing. When, when the knot... On my reel is like bigger than the reel itself. They know how to fix it. And, uh, you know, it's one thing, you know, just holding a rod and being able to reel up a fish. It's another thing to, like, know how to fish. And, and what I was thinking about this series, that's the gap. Because there's a lot of us here, we love to eat fish. How many of y'all love to eat fish? Yeah, yeah, seafood. Come on, I love it, I love it. Joe Patty's, if you don't know, trust me on this. Joe Patty's, not too far from here. Everything you want. Um, but there's a gap, but there needs to be a gain. There's a gap because there, there's a lot of us here that like we, we, we kind of like, like to fish, but we don't really know how to fish, but we really, really, really love to eat the fish. And so it's like, man, I would probably fish more if I knew how to fish. Navar, how many of you are like that? Raise your hand. Pensacola, hold it up. How many say like I would probably fish more if I really knew what I was doing? Uh, what I'm trying to say is I, I don't have confidence in my fishing ability, my skills, right? Like the last thing I want to do and the last thing you want to do probably is spend all day and not catch a thing. You ever been there before? Yeah, there's a reason why they call it fishing and not catching, right? But there's something happens every time there's a fish on moment. There's something that reawakens in me, and I was like, I was born for this. And after that second fish, I was like, I'm built for this. After that third fish, I'm like, I am eating all this. Come on, I, I love it. I love it. There's something special about fishing. The story I want to talk to you about today has everything to do with the series. In fact, the title of the message is Fish On. Because when you get a fish on the line, the goal is to get the fish on the boat. It's one thing to get a fish on the line. You're fishing for the mingos. And how many know dolphins love mingo? Right? Don't be praying for dolphins. Right? And your snapper, you're pointing these bigger fish coming up. They're like, thank you very much. I'm going to let you do the work. You tire them out. I'm and I got them. But a fish on the line is one thing, but a fish in the boat is a game changer. You know, and here's what I know about fishermen. Fishermen have stories. They have stories. So I was thinking about some of my stories of fishing, and a couple of stories just, man, just kind of surfaced as I was sitting there thinking about it. First time I remember fishing, I went, I was probably three or four, no more than four, and I remember it was somewhere in Tennessee, Gatlinburg area, and it was at a pond, and I had the little kitty fish pole, you know what I'm talking about, not a rod, the little Fisher Price or something. I remember doing that, and I remember seeing the fish, and they're, they're swimming around, I'm like, oh my gosh, look at those fish, and I kept looking, looking, looking. And I've always had this energy. <laughs> and, and so it led me to going face first in the water. And my eyes are open. Of course, I don't know how to swim yet. My eyes are open. The fish, they're swimming all. And I'm trying to catch it with my hands. And I remember the unseen hand coming up. And they grabbed me and picked me up out of the water. I was like, thanks, Dad. I wasn't sure how much longer I had. <laughs> He's probably like, I was letting you sweat it out a little bit. <laughs> you know. And uh, that was the first one. Then uh, fishing with Uncle Scott. We were in New York, upstate New York. We didn't have, ran out of bait. And he's like, you know what? I got some hot dogs. So he broke off pieces of the hot dog. We put it on. And I caught the biggest fish at that time. I was probably fifth grade or so. Biggest fish I'd ever caught. It was a carp. It was a pretty good sized fish. And I'll never forget that moment. It always endeared my heart to 
Uncle Scott because he took me to fish. Some of y'all have those moments, those relationships, those memories because of fishing. And, 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 and we get to a certain age and stage in life where we remember it's not just about catching the fish. It's who we're doing it with. Not just the destination, it's the climb. Got to write a song about that or something. But uh, I remember that, man, and being so excited. And, and then I remember in third grade, we did Awanas at the church we were at. My dad was, uh, he was teaching at a Christian school, and he was getting ready to plan a brand new church. And, and uh, so, man, me and my buddies, we went to this thing called Awanas, and it was kind of like the Boy Scouts for Jesus. <laughs> and so we learned Bible verses, and we had fun, and we had games and competitions, and we learned the Word of God at a young age. Yeah. Learned the Word of God. Well, our leader, and thank God for leaders, yeah. which are volunteers. Thank God for volunteers. Our, our leader, we lived in Miami, and our leader, he was like, man, I'm going to take all you boys, and he paid for it. I'm going to take you all deep sea fishing if you learn this many verses. So we were like, learn the Bible. <laughs> we were holding each other accountable. We learned the Bible, man. We got the Bible verses. He took us fishing. He paid for dinner at our favorite luxury restaurant with this was fine dining in third grade are you kidding me they serve fish it was mcdonald's it was amazing <laughs> and we loaded up on all this grease we loaded up on it and then we got in the boat and went deep sea fishing how many know that's not a good idea we probably had 25 or 30 guys and you can imagine what was the rest of the story yeah, yeah we were <laughs> I remember getting a catch, one of the first catches. Not because I'm like this great angler, but luck had a lot to do with it. And I remember all of a sudden, I'm like, and they're yelling, fish on! And I'm like, no, I'm reeling this thing. And it, was, it wasn't a little Fisher Price anymore. I still was probably about the same size. But it, it, was, it was a rod. It was a deep sea fishing rod. And it was, the reel was about as big as my head. And I'm cranking there like, crank it, crank it, crank it. And they'd already instructed us, hold on to the rod. They're worth a lot of money. So I pull up an electric gill. An electric gill. When they told me it was an electric gill, I was reaching to grab it. And then all of a sudden, I don't know what happened, but my left hand went, ah! And the rod goes overboard. Those are not cheap. Pretty expensive. I remember that moment. I'm thankful. I'm thankful that... That volunteer who probably paid for that didn't make me feel bad about it. Because you know what? It made me want to fish more. Yeah. And then this year, Brian, you and I went to Texas. We went out to West Texas, and we did some hunting, and we did something called fly fishing. It was my first time. Any of you ever fly fish? You ever been fly fishing? It's, it's different, isn't it? Yeah. It's pretty cool. So we went fly fishing, and our instructors were so cool, and they were telling us. And they, they were just like... You know, I mean, just professionals this is what they do for a living. They were phenomenal uh, guides, and man, they just taught us how to do it. And it was so much easier when they were talking about how to do it and doing it than when we did it. And we we're getting this, and we we're trying to, and, and it was like, man, we we're doing everything wrong. But they didn't get frustrated with us. They just kept instructing us and helping us, and just real chill, man. They're like, well, you know, if you kind of, and they'd already said it 10 times, 20 times, 100 times. But just like, okay. And then, then, Brian, you caught the first fish. You caught the first fish of the trip. Brian did over here. Give it up. Let's go. Let's go. Brian representing. And we had pastors from Pensacola Beach. My friend Jack Kale and Stuart. Stuart and Jack, they were on this trip with us with one of their friends, and it was us. And so I caught the most. And I paid him to say that. So I owe him money. I see how that went, that back and forth. And uh, I did, but it was luck again. It was totally luck because I wasn't catching nothing. And Brian's like, Whoa! you know, I mean, he's pulling them up. But there's something about fishing that when you get the fish on, it's a game changer. And this series is called Let's Go Fishing. Let's go fishing. It's, it's adventure. It's an invitation to adventure. It's an invitation to something that will truly radically change your life. And not how we try to do it changing our outside, but, but God will change us from the inside. And God will begin to give us his eyes, his vision, his heart, his strength, his wisdom. It's a game changer. 
So today I want to talk to you about fish on, and I want to tell this story. I want to set it up, because sometimes we can just take a few verses from the Bible, and if you don't study the Bible, sometimes verses almost look like they're saying something different. You're like, wait a second, were they in the boat or were they on the shore? Because this says shore, and this says a boat, but these guys, Matthew and Mark and John, they were eyewitnesses of Jesus. So they're telling the story from a little bit different angle. Baseball season's up, and I mean, it's, it's in now, and so you imagine someone sitting behind home plate. Someone sitting the first baseline, the third base. They're going to watch the same game, but they're getting a little bit different angle. And so when we go to Matthew chapter 4, when we go to Mark chapter 1, we find a similar story. We find a story where Jesus is, is calling his disciples. A disciple is a learner. So Jesus was known as like a rabbi, and a rabbi would go to young men, boys at a young age, to teenage guys, and they would say, hey, I think he could do what I do. I think he could learn what I've learned. I think he could walk in my footsteps. I think I could teach him. I think one day they could be, right? It's kind of kind of like, like coaching, you know, like a head coach. And man, this guy's a coordinator. One day I, I see a head coach in him, right? It's, it's that type of thing. And so Jesus is walking, and these guys had all been passed over, which meant that the rabbis of their day were like, I don't believe he has what it takes. Do you know that? How many, how many are thankful for the people in your life that believe you have what it takes? How many are thankful for those kind of people? How many got rid of the people didn't think you had what it, you know what I'm saying? That's right, like, don't hang out with the people that tolerate you. Hang out with the people that celebrate you. And so Jesus is on mission with a great commission, and Jesus is intentional. Someone say intentional. So Jesus is walking by, and Jesus sees these guys, and Matthew and Mark give us the account that, that, that Simon Peter, who you know Peter is, the one that denied Jesus, the one that walked on water, Peter, the one from Pentecost, that Jesus said, yeah, you denied me, I forgave you. Here's the keys, like preach the message at Pentecost when the power of God is going to fall and the Holy Spirit is going to move. And so the, Peter's there with his brother, and then you've got two brothers, uh, sons of Zebedee. They're also nicknamed later in the Bible. Jesus called them sons of thunder. thunder. When Jesus gives you a nickname like that. You're like, yeah, I'm a son of thunder. I got lightning and thunder. And sons of thunder, James and John. Later on, Peter, James, and John would be Jesus' inner circle. They would be the ones that Jesus passed the ball to when there's only a few seconds on the clock. They were the ones he was like, put the ball in his hands because he's going to score. Peter, James, and John. And we get insight to this story. In Matthew 4 and Mark chapter 1, Jesus is, is calling them to follow him. He says, hey, I know you're fishing right now. You got fishing nets and you're fishing for fish. But if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. Which literally in the original language means this. That if you follow me, Jesus was saying to them, if you follow me, I will literally empower you to catch men and women alive. You'll catch them alive. It's too late to catch them when they're dead. You've been fishing and you caught something. And you, oh, it's a, it was a tire. It was hooked on a rock. Or you got a fish and you were reeling it up and then a shark was like, hello. How many of y'all had that happen? I've had that happen. You get half a fish. You get the head of the fish. You're like, we got more bait. All right, here we go. Jesus Gives them an invitation, and Jesus gives you and me an invitation today, too, to follow him. And truly, if we follow Jesus, you and I will also become fishers of people. Here's, here's what I know. Followers fish. Followers fish. Followers fish. Jesus followers fish. Here's the whole message, sushi-sized into two words. You won't remember the stories. You won't remember everything, but you'll remember the message in two words. Say it with me. Followers fish. That's what followers do. You cannot follow Jesus very long and not fish. In fact, all through the Bible, people that met Jesus, people that were nothing like Jesus, fell in love with Jesus, and they turned around and brought others to Jesus when they were nothing like Jesus. 
tax collectors, liars, thieves, egomaniacs, doubters. But they, they follow Jesus, and Jesus taught them how to fish. How many had someone in your life, a grandparent, a father, an uncle, a mother, grandma, I don't know, aunt. How, how many had someone teach you how to fish? And when I talk about fishing, it takes you back to some really good memories. Isn't that cool? See, what I know is followers fish, and Jesus invited them, but they kind of watched Jesus. It was the first call, and they watched Jesus from afar. They'd seen some things that Jesus did. They'd seen some miracles, but now all of a sudden we're in Luke's gospel. And Luke chapter 5 is where our text picks up, 1 through 11. And, and now this is the second call. This is the second call, which makes sense to the story if you never understood the story before. Because this story talks about Jesus going and getting in this guy's boat. And, and it's like Jesus didn't even ask. And we're like, do we do a series on rude Jesus? <laughs> like if you just got a Tesla and you're like, yeah, man, look, and the key's in there. And you just hit the button. I'm like, cool, man, see you. I'll be back in a minute. I'm taking it for a spin. That's not cool, right? So growing up reading the story, I'm like, Jesus didn't even ask to use Peter's boat. He just stepped in it. I know Jesus has all authority, but like, but, but they were already familiar with each other. But see, there's, mm, 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 mm. there's, I wish I had an organ up here. There's a difference between being familiar with Jesus and being a follower of Jesus. There's a big difference. There's a big gap. It's a really big gap. And so let's pick up our text. Verses will be on the screen. Let's go to Luke chapter 5. I tried to read it from my Bible earlier. I want to blame it on the lights, but I think my eyes have something to do with it. Uh, I was like, I kept, kept getting closer and closer. So I'm going to read it where it's a little easier here. Luke 5, 1 through 11. One day, Jesus was preaching. By the way, Jesus chose preaching and the foolishness of preaching to be which, what wins the lost. To preach means to declare. It means to herald. To get it out there. So Jesus is preaching. Now. 2 Timothy chapter 4 says, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Right? Like if I'm carrying a concealed gun, like I, I've got one racked. One's in the chamber. I'm, I'm ready if danger should arise. So what Jesus is saying to preachers is, hey, 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 you don't take a, it's not you don't have vacations, but you don't, you don't take a moment off, man. Be ready to give the gospel. Be ready to preach the word. There are people who need to be encouraged. Encourage them. There are people that need to be corrected. Lovingly correct them, but preach the word. And here Jesus is doing that. He's preaching, but he's preaching on the shore of Galilee. If you're unfamiliar with Israel, the Sea of Galilee is up at the north. How many of you have ever heard the Jordan River? Uh-huh. And then the Dead Sea. And that's how it goes. So most of Jesus' ministry was done up north. And Jesus did so much around the Sea of Galilee and Capernaum. I mean, Jesus was, he was just doing so much. And, and so most of his ministry, about 70% actually, was done up the northern part of, of Israel. And so he's preaching, he's at the Sea of Galilee, and what happens? Great crowds pressed in on him. And why they come in? To listen to the word of God. You know why we come on Sundays? Because all of us need several things. All of us need several things. According to God's word, we need preaching. We need preaching. And, and, and it's not my goal to preach at you, but to preach to you. Because I'm right with you. You with me? So it's not like, ah, you're dirty. No, 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 no. It's like, man, I'm a sinner, but I've been saved by grace. And let me tell you something, man. This is something for all of us. This is something for me, as you'll hear about at the end of this message. But he's preaching. And what is he preaching? He's preaching the word of God and crowds are coming. Now, turn around. We got some empty seats in here. Not a lot, but we got some empty seats. Navar, I'm trusting by faith that you guys are totally packed out today, right? Let's go. Blackwater, you men are packed out. But you know what? Wherever there's an empty seat, it's an opportunity to fish. Right. Someone needs to fill that seat. Yeah. See, because when we go fishing, what we're doing is we're trying to get what's way out there or way down there here. Yeah. So we got to reel it in. And Jesus is reeling these people in. And what I love about Jesus was Jesus was real. And we're going to talk about that in the series. Let's go fishing. Jesus was real. And being real is what helps you and I reel them in. 
R-E-A-L to R-E-E-L. Being real. Because being fake doesn't work. You got to be real. Fishing's hard. So Jesus has gathered a crowd. You know why I love crowds? I love crowds because every time there's a crowd, there's a better chance for people to come to Christ. Because God didn't just save us to become a holy huddle. It's like us four no more. Kumbaya, my Lord. No, 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 no. God wants us to reach. God wants us to fish. God wants us to fish. Jesus is fishing. This crowd is pressing in. And, and, and let's read here. Let's pick up verse 2. They're listening to the word of God. Verse 2. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Fishermen would wash their nets when they were done. You get fish guts on there. You get seaweed on there. They would wash. They would repair. They would mend their nets. They would hang them out to dry so they'd be ready to use again. And they left them, they're washing their nets. Verse 3, stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. But what's crazy about that is as Jesus was stepping in the boat, he's like, hey, aren't you the owner? Hey, why don't you give me a push? Now, I don't know what motors you got on the back of your boats, but they didn't have those motors. Peter didn't have that motor on his boat. And not only is Jesus inviting him in, Jesus is... Also asking to Peter to engage. Yeah. And it hasn't changed since. Yeah. Jesus will pursue you. He will come to you. And Jesus will include you. Yeah. And so he's like, hey, push this thing out into the water. And, and so sure enough, man, it gets out. And, and, and now what happens? So he sat in the boat and he taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it's deeper and let down your nets to catch, and I love these words, some fish. Jesus is God. He's all-knowing, so he already knew what was going to happen. I think he kind of giggled. If I could just put the Timothy Jason Payne, the TJP little translation, I, I, I would just imagine Jesus like, Let's get, hey, just do this. We're going to catch some. Let's catch some fish. Now, he's talking to professional fishermen, and is a professional fisherman entitled to listen to a preacher tell him how to fish, when to fish? Where to fish? You going to tell me, Jesus? But, but watch what happens. He's teaching the crowds. They're going out to the water. Go where it's deeper. Master, verse 5, Simon replied. Notice, oh my gosh. Sometimes you're preaching and the Lord drops things on you while you're preaching. He's going to go from master here to later he's going to go to Lord. Amen. His conversion happens in this moment. And we'll get there in just a second. Master, you're a rabbi, you're the big dog. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night. How many know what it is to work hard all night? Anybody know what it is to work all night? You stayed up, you're working, you wanted to be sleeping, you're studying, you got a test, you're cramming, you got the spiritual gift of pro uh, procrastination, so you're cramming, you're trying, it's not a spiritual gift, and you're trying to get it in there, you're like, think, you're sleeping on it, oh, come on, come on, let's go, you're, you're praying, Jesus, please, I know you're the God of miracles, you know, you're like, you should have studied earlier, <laughs> you, you asking for a real big, well, a real big miracle right now, man. Um, and, and, and what's interesting here is that he's tired. See, working all night leaves you tired. And when you get tired, you get cranky, angry, hangry, frustrated. Every week, whenever I preach on something, the Lord's like, yeah, let's put a little bit of um, seasoning of what you're going to talk about in your life. So this morning, someone in my family had grabbed my phone and taken it. Because right now, half of our family... Today is in Navarre, and half of us here in Pensacola. And, um, and so anyways, our phones kind of look alike. And so they took my phone. My notes was on my phone, and I don't preach like from my notes. I got a scripture on here, right? But, like, but my phone wasn't there, which just caused all kinds of opportunities for attitude checks. <laughs> And so I'm looking all over the house. I'm tearing the house. We got company coming over this after. We got, we got lunch with a couple today. We got dinner tonight with a family from the church. And so, man, I'm just, I'm tearing up the house. I'm like, oh, my goodness, Steph's going to kill me. It was Steph took, anyways, I didn't say that. But, uh, but uh, so, so anyhow, she's got this new cover, and it looks like my cover. 
but it's got a little bling right there. But besides that, it looks like my cover. So she grabbed it, and I, and I was starting to feel a little fris- frustrated because I couldn't find what I needed. How many of you ever got frustrated, like as in today, yesterday? See, Peter is frustrated at this point, and we got to understand this. If we don't understand this, we, we don't get the story because he's fished all night. He didn't catch anything, which means he made no because that's why he fishes. He fishes to feed. And he, he's frustrated. He wants to go home to his tempur He wants to put his head on the pillow and forget it and then get another day of fishing. And see, just going fishing doesn't mean that the water's good. Right? The wind's good. Sometimes he had to fish when it was storming. He, we don't even know how his day went. But Jesus said, hey, let's go out further, drop those nets. Let's see if we can catch some fish here. And he goes from master... He says, I worked hard all night, didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, it's kind of like not my will, but your will be done. If you say, God, I don't think that's going to work. God, I don't understand why you took me through that. God, I I don't want to lose that job. But God, at your will, God, at your word, be it unto me. God, not what I want, but what you want. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, even in my world, not just on the world, in the world, but in my world, your will be done on earth. As it is in heaven. There's something about submission. There's something about surrender. There's something about realizing Jesus. You're not just master. You're Lord. So if you say something that doesn't make. "Mm, My God I'm starting to preach. If you say something that doesn't make sense to me. I can rest assured that you know something I don't know. That you already have seen my future. And you know the plans that you have for me declares the Lord. And there are plans to give me a hope and a future. I don't understand why this is happening. I don't like what you're asking of me. This doesn't feel good. I'm not comfortable. I'm moody. Anybody ever been there? And I think Jesus just kind of grins and says, I understand. Come on. Because Jesus knows what hangs, my God, get this. Jesus knows what hangs in the balance of obedience. He knows. And it's, he, he doesn't just work all things for decency and he's like, ah, hopefully it'll. No, no. Romans 8, 28. All things work together. All things. All things. Not some things. Not the good things. But all things work together for our good to those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. It's working together. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's working for my good. Because right now in your life, there's things that seem to be spinning out of control, and you're like, it doesn't make sense. This isn't helpful. I don't appreciate. I don't understand. God, why, why, why? And all we want to do is say, why, why, why? And Jesus said, why on the cross? And Jesus knew the answer. We say, why? Because we don't know the answer. But it's knowing that he is the answer. And so what does Peter do? Okay, God, it's your word. I'm going to do it. And you know what happens? Here's what happens. You go on and you read the verses. Here's what happens. They go out. They cast the net out. Nets were, or nets were their nets. Nets were their primary means of fishing. They had the lead weights. They would cast them. And you got to learn how to cast if you want to catch. You got to. You got to. And that's what this series is going to be about. This series isn't just going to be about you need to do this as a Christian. The series is going to be like, you know what? I want to equip you how to do it. Because fishing is hard when you don't know. It's really fun when you do know. I don't want to go with a go on a boat, charter boat with a guy who's like, you know, I never really fished before. I sure hope we can find some fish today. Like, give me the guy with the numbers, the digits, the coordinates. I get, give me that guy, the fish finder, like the really expensive one. And the guy, give me that. That's I want to catch fish. And and Simon Peter surrenders, and they catch so many fish. That scripture says that the nets began to tear. Now that's a problem because your net is what's holding the fish. The net tears and the fish swim away. So you know what he did? He he screamed out, help! Because they're fishing partners. The sons of thunder later would be nicknamed by Jesus they were also out there on the shore. And so what they do, they get in their boat and they're going, they're trying to get there. And Peter's like, hurry, hurry, get here quicker. So many fish that the nets begin to tear, but it doesn't stop there. And at this time, their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help 
brought the partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish on the verge of sinking. I've never seen a boat on the verge of sinking because it had so many fish in there. That's crazy. So the nets are getting ready to tear. Now the boat's getting ready to sink, and now it's a totally different situation. Remember, he just fished. He just got out of the water fishing, hadn't caught a thing. And, and don't you know Jesus, who's creator of the world, he made the fish. It's his fish. It's his water. He gave us authority over the fish. That ought to be your life verse if you're an angler. God said, I give you authority over all the fish of the sea. That's right. You were made to slay them. You were created to slay them. Just accept it by faith. I'm a fish slayer. They don't want none of me. They see me, they're swimming away. You're given authority. But you know what? Jesus has so much authority. I, I just bet Jesus had that thought and he said, fish, swim into the net. And now all of a sudden, so many different fish, type of fish, big fish, small fish. There's so many fish in this net. Now they're in the boat and the boat's starting to sink. And watch what happens. Watch what happens. When Simon Peter realized what happened, when Simon Peter realized what happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus. And he said, oh, 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 Lord, oh, oh, Lord. See, he went from master to Lord. See, it's not about religion that gets you into heaven. It's about a relationship with Jesus. See, see, masters, like what everyone calls them, Lord is more personal. He had a conversion moment at this point. Scripture says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You'll be forgiven. You'll be made new. God will declare you righteous. All your sin is gone. gone. And when God looks at you, he sees Jesus and his goodness and his righteousness. And here's Peter's conversion moment which happened during the second call. that You see, Jesus didn't give up. In Matthew 4 and Mark chapter 1, Jesus had already invited them to come, but just because you invite someone doesn't mean they come the first time. You with me? You got to keep inviting them. Jesus knew what hung in the balance. He knew that on the second invitation that Peter would become a Christian, a Christ follower, a disciple, and he knew what that meant for the church. And he knew what that meant for the world because he was going to not only catch him, but he was later going to release him. And Peter was going to go after Jews and teach them that Jesus was the Messiah and is the Messiah. He falls to his knees and he says, he says to him, he realized what happened. And he said this, oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. See, he confessed his sin and he declared Jesus Lord. And that's all it takes to come to Christ. Amen. That's all it takes. You accept that he's Savior, that he's Lord, and you believe in your heart. And so watch what happens. He says, oh, Lord, please leave me on such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish that they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the son of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. Just think of all the things Jesus could have said. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. Could it be that you got the wrong idea about Jesus? Could it be that your shame is not what he wants to smear in your face? It's actually what he wants to get rid of. That the hurt that's still there, he's not there to, oh, oh, that, oh, oh, oh that, that hurts right there, that muscle sore, oh, that one right there. Could it be that he actually just wants to heal? Could it be that he wants to take fear away? Because fear is actually the opposite of love. And he says here, I love this, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and they followed Jesus. They left everything and followed Jesus. They didn't do it the first time, but they did it that time. Why? Because they realized he was more than master, he was Lord. He is in full control. That's called sovereignty. I want to just confess. Confession is good for the soul, and I want to have a confessing moment. Um, I went to Bible school here in Pensacola, and, and my major was evangelism. So if you know anything about me, my heart is to lead people to Jesus. That's why I exist. 
It's why our church exists, to lead people to passionately follow Jesus. That's our mission, to lead people to passionately follow Jesus. But, but they won't follow him if they never hear about him. And there are people in this area that don't even know John 3.16. Aren't we in the South? Isn't this kind of the Bible belt? People don't. I'm telling you, I ask people all the time at restaurants, have you ever heard of John 3.16? I don't know what you're talking about. Who's John? Juan? Who, who are you talking about here? There are people that don't even know. And so... I graduated, interned at this church two and a half years and stayed the whole summer afterwards and got licensed, which means the men of God put their hands on me and prayed over me and said, we recognize God's hand is on this young man. I was 20, 22 at the time, golly, 1998, August, and they prayed over me and man, men of God prayed over me and it was a holy moment. I was crying. They were crying. They were weeping. And um, that night... There was a guy that I worked for in town off a of pace. Uh, it was Nebraska Prime Meats. I used to drive one of the big trucks. It was a freezer truck, and I would deliver monthly, you know, and I'd deliver, like, you know, uh, steaks and all kinds of ribs and all that kind of stuff, and sometimes freezers. And, and there were two guys, the owner and the co-owner. They were both alcoholics. When I was in college my sophomore year, they took me out on their boat. I hadn't been out on the boat. hadn't been out on a boat like that ever. And I just remember, like, this is living because we left the land, and we we're going out, and I'm watching it get further and further away. I was like, oh, yeah, that's why I could get used to this. And they, they were so unlike Jesus, and people that don't know Jesus are unlike Jesus. Fish actually smell like fish. Fish are actually messy. So we can't be pharisaical, and oh, that person, I'm going to get near that person. Fish smell like fish. And you smelled before you were caught. And maybe you still smell a little bit. <laughs> I got a middle school young man. That's all I'm talking about right now. I'm just saying, like, get that shower, boy. Put that deodorant on in Jesus' name. Again. Do it again. Well, long story short, long story short, God was working my heart. And I would say different things and be light and be salt. And I believe, like, in our heart as Christians, I believe in what's called lifestyle evangelism, that we ought to just live Jesus every day, like I ought to walk with Jesus, I ought to talk like Jesus, I ought to have the love of God, I'm not perfect, I am forgiven, but I got to shine my light. Yeah. Scripture says, be ready to give everyone an answer of the hope that's within you. That's right. So if I'm a Christian, walk around like I've been sucking on a lemon, ain't nobody going to want what I have. They're going to, Right? But there ought to be something different in me that people are like, man, when I walk into a place, the atmosphere ought to shift. Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And I stepped into the room, which means the power of Almighty God stepped into the room. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is present if you didn't know. Are you with me? That's what I carry inside me. That's what you carry inside you. And so... Man, God's working on my heart, and I need to lead this guy to, life, to Christ. And I've been trying to lifestyle evangelism, but I also believe Proverbs tells us, whoever wins souls is wise. In other words, you got to be wise to win souls, but if you win souls, you're also wise because you actually get it. You actually get that heaven isn't, heaven, heaven, or excuse me, here on earth wasn't just about filling seats, it's about filling heaven. That followers fish is what we do. It's not, it's not where a used car salesman, nothing knocking that. If you are, I don't mean it like that, but I'm not forcing you. Let's, let's do one better than that. That's a bad rap. Let's go timeshare. How about that? Let's go old school timeshare. You know what I'm saying? And the fifth person comes in, the sixth person, you're like, okay, I can do it. And you get a timeshare. You talk me into it. You twist my arm enough. All right, here we go. Um, that's not what we're called to do, but we are called to go and tell. We are called to tell people that there's a Savior. That he loves you. Jesus loves you. He died for you. We are to do it. And, man, I was feeling the conviction. And fast forward through this story. And um, they, they prayed over me. They licensed me. And I was driving back all night to Nashville, where we're from. And the Holy Spirit was like, go by and witness to Bill. Go by and witness to Bill. Go by and witness to Bill. So I drove up to Bill's house. We had church that night. It, it, by this point, I don't know, 9.30, I'm guessing. And uh, so it wasn't late for me, but he was older, and I thought, man, I've showed up. There's no lights on in the house. The cars were there. I should have gone up. I'm sitting there. My car's packed. I've got to drive all night, but I know the Lord was like, go witness to Bill. And I get there, and I let the devil talk me out of it. I listened to the enemy. 
And I sat there and I was like, man, this. And the devil was saying, by the way, the devil will talk as long as you listen. The devil was saying, it's too late. It's too late. Don't go up there, man. You're going to make a fool out of yourself. Come on, man. He's older. He's probably in bed. Been in bed two hours. Don't do that. You need to get home. You know your mama's worried about you driving all night. You hear me? Yeah. You know what I did? I drove away. I was in front of his house. I drove away. I went back, got a job. That was August. Steph and I got married in April, which our 25th anniversary is coming up April 10th. <laughs> She's my better everything, y'all. She ain't my better half. She's my better everything. And, and, um, the church that I served at, volunteered at, interned at, they called me to come on staff. And so I was thinking about Bill months in between. And I was like, as soon as I get back, I'm going to go to his house. And that's what I did. I drove up to his house, knocked on that door. His wife answered the door, but her countenance was a little bit different. I said, hey, hey, the hug, I'm here. I could tell she's heavy. I said, hey, I said, um. He said, is Bill here? I wanted to talk to him. I had something really, really important I need to share with him. I've been thinking about it for months. And she said, um, he died a few, few months ago. And in that moment, I can't tell you how I felt. I can't tell you everything that ran through my mind because I wasn't obedient. I felt the weight of someone's eternity. When I knew, when I went to Bible college, when I majored in fishing for people, it still puts tears in my eyes to this day. And if he cried out for Jesus in his last moments, Jesus would be right there. How do I know that? Because he did it for someone on a cross. He'd do it wherever you are. It broke my heart. Broke my heart. I don't ever want to feel that again. Yeah. So I want to wrap up this message. And um, I, I need my friend Bogley here. You wonder why we've been watching Bogley. <laughs> Bogley is a beautiful fish. He says, uh-oh. Um, see, you, disciples were catching fish with the nets. How many think I can catch him? <laughs> Not that hard, right? I probably could catch him pretty, pretty easily. By the way, you know what? Jesus can catch people real easy. Yeah. He knows how to get to them. He's a master at it. It's not hard for him to do it. The people that you think, man, they use God's last name, think it's a cuss word. Yeah. He can reach those people too. Well, come here, Bogley. I need your help. You got to help me illustrate this. All right, come here. You use it. Oh, yeah, he don't want to come, but he's caught. He's caught. Now, I hope he doesn't fall off. Here's what I know about Bogley. Bogley doesn't want to be out of the water. <laughs> Did he make it? I saved him. I saved him. Woo. He is cussing me out in fish words. But I had a thought I wanted to drop and leave with you. Isn't it funny how some of us were more concerned about a fish than we are our family and our friends that they might die without Christ? Let's pray. Bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to talk to Christians first. How many Christians are here? You say, Pastor Tim, I know I'm a Christian. I'll be honest with you. I don't know how to fish. I couldn't lead someone to Christ if it, if, if it, I, I, I couldn't. If I, if I needed to and pulled up on an accident and that person was dying, I, I, I wouldn't know what to do. I know I'm going to heaven, but I don't know how to fish. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Just hold it up. There's no condemnation. To those who are in Christ Jesus, this isn't a guilt thing. This isn't a shame on you thing. This is a, I'm going to teach you how. How many Christians say, I don't know how to fish? Raise it up. Hold it up high. It's a lot of hands. You can put them down. God bless you. How many would say, I'm a Christian? 
But like the story you told, Pastor Tim, I just, I've not been fishing. I've not been fishing. I've not been fishing. I know followers fish, but I've not been fishing. How many would say that? You just raise your hand and say, I just, I've not been fishing. I've been fishing. There's a lot of hands, a lot of hands. All right, now, if you're a Christian, whether you raise your hand the first time or the second time, but you want to go fishing, you want to go on the biggest, best adventure of your life, Jesus said, if you follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And I would say this, if you and I aren't catching men and women alive, then who are we following? Because Jesus doesn't lie, and he said, if we follow him, we would catch fish. He said, if we follow him, we'd catch people. We'd catch men, we'd catch women alive. There's some of you here today, it's your chance to be caught by the net of God's love, which has spread so wide, the hook of the gospel, the fact that God loves you so much, he died on the cross, he shed his blood because you were born a sinner and you chose sin. No one taught you how to steal. No one taught you how to lie. No one taught you how to get angry and just lose it. No one taught you that. It, it, was, it was just our nature because, because Adam and Eve, they sinned and sin spread. And because sin spread, death spread. And so Jesus said, well, you know what? I will substitute and I will die. I will take their place. The, the righteous died for the sinful so the sinful could become righteous. And Jesus on that cross, Father God turning his back on him, Jesus spread out his hand and said, I love you this much. He died on the cross. He shed his blood. He, he couldn't have he couldn't passed out and died. Jesus had to shed his blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Jesus had to die. He was the Lamb of God to be slaughtered for the world, including your world. That's how much Jesus, he ran to you. He ran to you. I love the verse that says, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you. Romans, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Why did he die? Because he's for you. He already took your place. He knows you can't get 100. He knows you're a, a sinner by birth and a sinner by choice. He knows you. You have so many hurts and habits and hangups and sin that, that has destroyed parts of your lives. And he knows it so much, he did something 2,000 years ago. He died on a cross. He said, I'll pay for their sin. Give me the bill. I'll pay it. The whole bill and the tip. Once and for all, in full, I'll pay it. And Jesus paid for all of your sins so that you could receive a free gift. Heaven. And his name's Jesus. And if you're here today and you're not a Christian, let me tell you something. As much, trust me, as much as you wanted to run back and Wanted me to run back and put Bogley back in the water. I wanted it. And how much more does God want to rescue you from being ensnared in a different type of net? One that's going to drag you to hell. God's love is for real. Scripture says if you'll confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. If you believe in your heart, God raised him, Jesus, from the dead. You will be saved. For it's with the mouth that confession is made. That's with a heart that we believe. And I believe there are people watching all over the world. I believe there are people watching in Navarre. I believe there are people watching at Blackwater. I believe there are people right here in Pensacola that today is your day to cross that line of faith. God loves you. He knows you. God is coming after you. And, and, and listen, religion will tell you everything you got to do. God says, no, it's already done. One of the last things Jesus said on the cross is it is finished. It's done. Jesus already paid your sin debt. All you got to do is receive it. As many as receive him, to them, he gives the right to become the sons and the daughters of God, even to those that believe on his name. There are people here right now, today, that's your step. You've been coming. You'd be like, man, I don't know. I, my hands get a little sweaty and I like the music. And Man, I'm not sure if I buy in today, but you need to become like Simon Peter and you need to go from acquaintance to Lord. And if you're ready to do that, I want to lead you in a sinner's prayer. The way we do it at Momentum is we pray it out loud together. You, you never, you, you get saved once. You get born again once. And, but, but we say it every Sunday for people who will pray it and say it for the first time. So we don't want anyone to pray it alone. Say it alone. So we're going to pray together. You're not talking to me. You're not going through me. We're going right to heaven. Talking right to Jesus. He's our intercessor. He's our mediator. So let's pray to him right now. Would you say, Jesus, I am a sinner. And like Simon Peter... I acknowledge my sin, and I acknowledge you are Lord. I receive your love today, and all that comes with it. Thank you for loving me, bleeding for me, dying for me, 
I believe you rose again. I make you my Lord and Savior. Say it again. I make you my Lord and Savior. I give you my life. I receive your life. Now teach me how to live. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Look up here. Man, look, can we just put our hands together real quick? God is doing incredible things right now. I believe if you called on the name of the Lord, you're just as saved as this preacher is. If you're watching online, you're on a plane, wherever you are, you're watching and you said, Jesus, save me. You know what he did? He saved you. Your name was written in what's called the Lamb's Book of Life. Ain't no eraser, ain't no devil can take your name out of that. Jesus said, if you're not ashamed of me in front of men, I will not be ashamed of you in front of my Father, which is in heaven. Sounds like a pretty good trade-off. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to celebrate you because this is a spiritual birthday. You got a physical birthday, now you got a spiritual birthday. And we want to celebrate you. We're not going to embarrass you, but if you pray that prayer for the first time, I want you to put your hand so high in the air. I want you to hold it up. We're going to clap for you. We're going to celebrate you. That's why people were up at 4.30 this morning to make church happen. That's why people get up. That's their why. To lead people. To passionately follow Jesus. And how will they know if they can't hear? And how will they hear without a preacher? And so if you made that decision, man, hold it up. You're watching online, Facebook, you're watching. Let us know in the chat. Tell us, Jesus made me new. We want to follow up with you. Would you do that? On the count of three. I want you to be bold. I want you to be courageous. On the count of three, I want you to put that hand in the air. Here we go. One, two, three. Hold it up. Shoot it up. Let's go. Put that hand up. God bless you. God bless you. Let's go. Come on. Let's go, Blackwater. God bless you. God bless you. Let's go. God bless you. One, two, three. Let's go. Come on. Let's go, momentum. Come on. Let's go. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. It never gets old. If you know Jesus, I'm going to teach you how to get him in the boat. I'm going to teach you this series. I want you to come back next week.